ان الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ونبيه ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما After praising Allah Azza wa Jal while admitting that we can never praise him to the extent that he deserves and testifying that none is worthy of our worship and our devotion but Allah alone without any partners the king of kings subhanahu wa ta'ala and that the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam was in truth his prophet and his messenger and the seal of revelation to this world before the coming of the hour and after reminding myself and everyone here and everyone hearing us with the taqwa of Allah, our duty to Allah to remain conscious of Him and dutiful to Him until we breathe our last, I welcome my brothers and sisters to the house of Allah Azza wa Jal on another blessed Jumu'ah. And the reminder this afternoon is a particular incident, a conflict, a domestic conflict, a marital conflict that happened between the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his wife Aisha radiallahu anha that every time I revisit, my head drifts to very far away places from the endless list of things we can learn from it, not just for our marriages. So Imam Ahmad and Abu Dawood and others authentically report and trace back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through a Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu anhu that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an one time came and knocked on the door of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam seeking permission to enter. And then he heard something that he could not bear behind the door, which was the voice of his daughter Aisha Radiallahu Anha getting louder and louder, arguing with the Prophet Sallallahu raising her voice, yelling in anger. And so he, as soon as he got in, he went for her. He reached for her to, to slap her, the narrator says. And he said to her, Yabnata Ummi Ruman, O daughter of Umm Ruman. It's a very uncommon expression because you're the daughter of your father ordinarily. But he attributed her to her mother in that one as if you're, I don't know you. You're not my daughter. How could you? So he said, O daughter of Umm Ruman. And he reached to strike her. And so the Prophet wasallam saw him coming, saw the anger in his eyes, saw him saying, How dare you raise your voice at the Messenger of Allah wasallam." And he jumps between them. And he tries to hold back Abu Bakr for a while until Abu Bakr radiallahu an calms a bit and turns around and storms out of the house. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then turns to Aisha radiallahu anha yataraddaha, seeking to win her over if you will. And he says to her jokingly, lightheartedly, أَرَأَيْتِ كَيْفَ حُلْتُ بَيْنَكِ وَبَيْنَ الرَّجُلِ You saw what I just did there? You saw how I just got between you and that guy? Her father? I mean, I just saved you. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an <coughs> days later comes to visit them again and he hears a very different tone in the house before he enters. He hears them joking and laughing with each other. And so he enters the house and he says to them, أَفَلَا تُدْخِلَانِ عَلَى سِلْمِكُمَا كَمَا أَدْخَلْتُمَانِ عَلَى حَرْبِكُمَا Why don't you guys let me in on your, your peace treaty, if you will, your peace, the same way you let me in on your war. Like, why didn't you guys tell me that things are better? And so the Prophet ﷺ uh, said to him, قَدْ فَعَلْنَا قَدْ فَعَلْنَا We have certainly done so, we have certainly done so. We've certainly resolved things, and we're, we're certainly confirming that to you. And obviously, this is just, uh, a conflict like no other, right? A very unique way conflicts play out that is very uncommon. 
And there's so much to learn from it. The most obvious aspect that you all see and you're all smiling about is just the phenomenal character of the Prophet ﷺ in how he dealt with someone who became angry in front of them or angry towards them. And this is a lost art, how to absorb people's anger in relationships, how to manage difficult people. This is not just for giving us peace of mind and managing well our relationships. This is for the sake of also you being able to deepen your relationships with people. You need to be able to work through conflict. You see, relationships only climb to a certain level when you work through these problems together. I know one couple who I always pray for out of fear that I will <laughs> hit them with the evil eye or something who have a superb marital relationship. And one of them said to me very early on in our marriage, it wasn't like this. Every time we, we, we got into like a, a tense moment, a little bit of a tip off, it would become stonewalling. We wouldn't speak to each other for days. We wouldn't know how to deal with each other until I said to her, he said to me, the husband, listen, we have to get through this. I'm not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. So we're just going to have to solve this. He said that was a point of ascension, a point of maturity in our relationship. And I didn't know until Allah guided me to say that. I didn't realize that her fear the whole time was that I would walk out upon the first conflict. And so when I said that, I'm not going anywhere, you're not going anywhere, let's deal with the problem on hand. That is when we were able to actually mitigate our problems, actually negotiate them, actually work through them. And I'll be very honest with you, perhaps the, the biggest reassurance I had moving to this community was that I used to visit this community for years on end, just a weekend a month, some of you know this. And some of the leadership of this community came to consult me in their conflict. And when I saw their integrity against those that offended them, may Allah keep them that way and increase them, when I saw their integrity against those who hurt them, that is when you develop a greater degree of confidence in a, person's, in a person's dignity, a person's ethical principles. And that is why I said, perhaps this is a community that I can break my own rule of never wanting to be an imam and grow with. And so this is something we all need to learn how to do. Managing difficult situations, managing difficult people, managing each other so that we can grow in our relationships. You know, also think about the fact that Aisha anha, was raising her voice on the Prophet You know, of the things that my head always drifts to is not just the fact that she should not have done so. But it's also the fact that this is not the Aisha that so many critics of Islam try to paint in our heads. They make it look like it's some sort of abusive relationship where this young girl was taken advantage of billah. to the end of that story that I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have heard. Look at the confidence of this woman, right? Look at how she can talk back to, and this is not justifying this at all, right? We don't want conflict in our homes at all. But the fact that she was reassured enough to put her guard down, which obviously led to some adverse effects sometimes, and the Prophet ﷺ let her and work, helped her work through that time and time again. You know, like, forget the numbers and the age of the marriage differential and all this stuff. Aisha radiallahu anha was a woman of great strength, a woman of great confidence, a woman, she was not a girl. You know, even the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, the most intimidating of them, were spoken back to by Aisha radiallahu anha. In fact, one of our scholars, Imam Zarkashi rahimahullah, has an entire book called Al-Ijaba uh, Fi Iradi Mastadrakatu Aisha Tu Ala Sahaba. <laughs> Basically, it's a documentation of all the times Aisha spoke back to Umar, spoke back to Abu Musa, spoke back to Sa'ad, spoke back to so and so and so and so. This hadith helps you realize that the relationship there was not the relationship of billah, exploitation, inferiority, trauma, or otherwise. Show me all of the traumatized young boys and girls in the world who had traumatizing childhoods as they tried to picture Aisha or depict her. What have they produced? 
Aisha was a great woman of great confidence, of great knowledge, all because she had the ease to say to the Prophet Sallallahu ask him and inquire and what the other Sahaba could not. You know, another great lesson here is the humility of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam seeking to please Aisha. When Abu Bakr walks out and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tries to please her and say, they were just fighting, they're right? <laughs> Say to her, you saw how I protected you, like you owe me one. If the whole world were upset at the Prophet wasallam, would that do him any harm? Allah Azza wa would defend his Prophet against the entire planet. But for him to go out of his way to seek the pleasing of his wife, it shows you the great security he had as, as a husband, and the great humility he had as a human being, which so many of us lack. You know, to the point that the Qur'an itself told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam don't give in too much because this may be misunderstood as legislation by your following. Right? Allah Azza wa Jal said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam لما تحرم ما Why do you restrain yourself from things that Allah made permissible? When Aisha and Ah Hafsa were jealous of Zainab in another incident that she was the only one that could afford to serve the Prophet ﷺ honey, they kind of agreed that whenever he would come from Zainab's house, having eaten honey, that they can't afford to serve him, they would cover their mouth as if, what's that smell? And so out of consideration for Aisha, for Hafsa, he said, I will never eat honey again. What he loved, he stepped down from to appease Aisha and Hafsa. And so Allah Azza wa Jal had to tell him, no, not there. Do not do that because you're the legislator. You are perceived as the one who speaks on behalf of Allah. If you stop eating honey, people will think honey is haram, will think honey is unlawful. So Allah said to him, why do you refrain from what Allah made halal for you? Tabtaghi mardata azwajik, seeking by that the pleasure of your spouses. Someone that's very egotistical perhaps can stick to that phrase, don't seek the, the pleasure of your spouses, where all Allah Azza wa was really doing here was, don't overlook the fact that you're not like any ordinary husband. You may actually need to hold back a little bit for the sake of everyone else. Whereas everyone else should never feel so insecure or so arrogant they cannot give room to their family members or their community members and appease them, meet them halfway or more. May Allah grant us and you the humility of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah al-azim li wa lakum. Alhamdulillahi wahdahu wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'da. Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lahu. Ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa nabiyuhu wa rasuluh. You know, of the beautiful lessons uh, in this very unique conflict uh, or incident of the conflict between the Prophet ﷺ and, and Aisha, or more so between Aisha and her father, it, it changed directions very fast, is that part of kindness to your parent is for you to hide from them, not always, but what you can of your struggles. Did you see how Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an he left and then he came back days later and of course this was said in light spirit the Prophet sallallahu did not do wrong here Aisha didn't do wrong here or else the Prophet sallallahu would have pointed it out to her but the fact that Abu Bakr is still concerned about his daughter right like oh you guys are better why you guys didn't tell me why didn't you tell me and so part of kindness to your parents is to realize that your parents can be hurt for you more than you are hurt for yourself and at times also, you may get past your hurt and they're, they're still hurting. And so in light spirits, of course, this happens. But in principle, it is a very important concept to remember. There are very valuable people in your life who sometimes care about you and like ache for you for longer than you ache for yourself. And try to spare them that when you can. You know, for example, in, in the age of very shallow, superficial, social media relationships we confuse 
between the value of someone who gives us of their free time, they throw us a like here or a text message there, give us of their free time, and the people in our life who time and time again, they free up their time for us. They stop on a dime to serve us. They always make themselves available for us. They allow us to climb out of our ditches and our meltdowns on their shoulders. You cannot confuse between these two. These people, we must value and cherish them and not be like that person who always turns away the moment the problem is solved. We do that a lot. We conflate between our shallow, wide social circle and between the most valuable people in our life that when our lives go dark, they, they're like that candle that burns away at themselves to give us a little bit of, of light in the darkness. Be very aware of that. Your friends and your parents, your friends and your family, these are not the same people. Treating them equally would be wrong. So how about when we treat the inferior relationships with greater value than the superior relationships? And the only thing uglier than that, and with it I'll end the khutbah, is that when we do this with Allah all the time, we come to him and we beg him and we look to him and we weep to him and we promise to him to get us out of our, th our hard times. And the moment he does, every single time, we're nowhere to be found. We run away from his path. Allah said, as if he never knew our name. Just moments ago, you were so desperate. We do that with Allah all the time, all of us. As one of the poets says, نحن ندعو الإله في كل كرب he says, we call upon God at every calamity, every tragedy. And then we forget him so quickly as soon as he removes that tragedy. How do we continue to expect our prayers to be accepted and responded to when we've blockaded their path using our, the sins we send up? We've obstructed their path. We cannot continue doing this forever. And let me say, let me at least say, that one of the, the most hopeful ways I lean on when I'm on the receiving end of callous treatment, when I find people that only reach out to me when they're having a meltdown, I say, let me forgive them. So if you're that parent or you're that person, let me forgive them for only reaching out to me in their bad times, in their struggling times, so that perhaps Allah will forgive us for only reaching out to Him in a genuine way during our hard times. May Allah Azza wa continue to teach us from the guidance of his book and the example of his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah continue to further the mention of his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and help us embody the ideal character that he lived and the Quran that he was walking the earth Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. May Allah better our relationships in our homes and in our communities. May Allah Azza wa help us to leave a meaningful, lasting impact on our partners, on our children, on our world before we exit it. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma gfil lana warhamna. Allahumma gfil lana warhamna. Allahumma gfil lana warhamna. Allimna ma yinfa'una. Wanfa'na bima allamtana. Wazidna ilma. Allahumma izza al-islam wa unsu al-muslimin. Wa adhilla al-zalamata wal-mu'tadeen. Allahumma qbalna fi khidmati deenik. Istamilna wa la tastabdilna. Wa taqabbal ya rabbana minna. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka'a nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.